Welcome everyone. My name is Crispin Conroy. I'm the International Chamber of Commerce Representative Director in Geneva. Thank you for joining the International Chamber of Commerce UN Global Compact co-hosted event on recommitting to the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and on implementing the UNGP 10 year plus roadmap over the next decade. I'm very pleased that the leaders of both our organizations are with us today. Let me inform you that uh, this event is being recorded and the recording may be shared and distributed publicly. We have two panels today. The first, a high level panel moderated by Dante Pesce, uh, of, uh, the chairperson of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. And the second, a panel of senior business led leaders moderated by Carolyn Rees, president of SHIFT. Uh, Dante and I happen to be at the same event, which is why we're, we're sitting next to each other. Uh, uh, over to you, Dante, just to make some opening remarks and then to introduce the panelists and ask them to share their views on the topic of today's event. Please then hand over to Caroline mm -hmm. and my colleague, Andrew Wilson, the ICC Global Policy Director and Permanent Observer to the United Nations in New York, will then make some closing remarks. So, thank you, Dante. Thank you, Crispin, for the invitation and all of you for participating. Uh, my name is Dante Pesce. I'm from Chile in South America. Currently, I'm in Geneva, but just for two weeks. In the context of the celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, I just want to say a few opening remarks and then give the floor to our panelists. Um, we are in, we conducted a, a one year process to evaluate the first 10 years of implementation of the guiding principles. Uh, there were more than 200 written submissions, uh, including Global Union, led by Sharon, and indeed, uh, Global Business, Global Indigenous People, uh, Global Civil Society, and a long, long, long range of different stakeholders, including governments. As I said, more than 200. We organized more than 30 ad hoc consultations, plus we plug in ourselves in more than 40 additional consultations that took place in all regions of the world with all stakeholders involved. Different levels of engagement, uh, some more prepared than others, some more, uh, let's say, into the guiding principles and knowledgeable than others, some with better experiences, some with really bitter experiences or not at all. Nevertheless, this was a, a process in which we calculate that approximately 10,000 people engage directly in one way or another in this process. And that is a very important thing. We, we really put attention to listen, and as the Secretary General of the UN have called, inclusive multilateralism. We don't have the answer. Um, we're not gurus that can figure out how to solve societal challenges of the magnitude of respecting human rights by business without listening, without engaging, and without participation. So that's the first thing. What have we learned and what have we listened to? First thing, for some, mostly business and governments, is a half full glass story more positives than negatives, inspiration, uh, pilot faces, pioneers, experiments, learning by doing, peer learning exercises, etc. That is in fact happening, um, in which is very good news. In parallel, we have a half empty glass story, mostly uh, described to us by unions, indigenous leaders, civil society leaders, with a level of frustration in terms of speed, scale, and, and how the guiding principles are being deployed in practice, how are being integrated in real policies and not just superficial declarations of good intentions. So, and, and of course, there's a lot in between, a, a lot in between. But the overall picture is that we're describing the same glass. Uh, we have the same framework, and there is an acceptance that the guiding principles are playing or can play a transformational role and actually can be part of a roadmap of transformation. So we have good foundations. And that is something that was not around us uh, 10 years ago. There was no clarity. It was hope, the uh, expectations, a possibility, but it was unclear what was going to be the outcome of the implementation. So what have we heard um, in, when we look at the three pillars? Um, 
in, regarding pillar one, very clearly the lack of policy coherence at global level within the UN family and at national level or regional level. Policy coherence, policy coherence, up and down. And our report goes deep into policy coherence and the lack of lead leadership by example. Leading by example is not the norm by governments, is the exception, but is not completely absent, which is good news again, because we do have uh, examples of governments that are leading by example, but of course, uh, th this is still pioneer, uh, pioneer level. That's, that's one thing. Uh, another thing um, on pillar two, uh, business are not scaling up or speeding up the, uh, uh, let's say, the integration of the guiding principles or the practice of due diligence well enough. And that is, for the, for the most part, something that is missing. But we do have pioneers, we do have coalitions, we do have early adopters. Um, there are companies learning by doing, there are leaders in this field, so we're not hopeless at all. We're just slow. We have been moving in an incremental approach and we need to move into exponential. But the potential is there. Um, we're also uh, listening about business models that should be challenged, data and information, accountability, coherence by business, in one hand advocating for the right causes at the same time, but with another hand advocating for wrong causes. Um, and corruption, corporate capture of the states, and in many cases in weak governance zones. Um, the enabling environment is not necessarily there. Um, and we have uh, limitations in, um, in effective implementation. Uh, we haven't raised the ambition yet, but it has potential. We can do it. Um, we need to address the power imbalance between the powerless and the powerful in order to have legitimacy, uh, legitimate outcomes of participation, dialogue, uh, et cetera. Um, rights holders participation, very uneven. We have some places in some countries where participation is good, active, empowered people. Many, many other places is quite the opposite. Um, and that hurts legitimacy, outcomes and solutions for societal challenges without participation and without engagement of uh, rights holders of course will lack uh, legitimacy. Um, access to remedy on pillar three remains absent in many places. And, and we see uh, during the COVID crisis that actually we have not been improving, quite the opposite. There are many, many jurisdictions where we're actually progress is, is the opposite. We're going backwards. Um, access to remedy and, and grievances and grievance mechanisms are far from good. Nevertheless, again, we do have examples that are actually showing that it is possible to do it um, well. Uh, there is a call for addressing or confronting impunity, um, which in many cases is something that creates a lot of unrest uh, at the local level. And, and we do see two big, big tracks that are super positive. One is the regulatory wave taking place in Western Europe uh, with human rights due diligence at the center. Um, that is incredibly important. It's actually moving in the right direction. We welcome the smart mix to move from mostly voluntary or almost exclusively soft law into a smart mix that includes mandatory uh, human rights due diligence. But that has to be accompanied by companying measures. Uh, legislation is not enough and it will not be a miracle or a silver bullet in itself. It requires a, a whole set of accompanying measures. And also, this is a conversation that is pretty much only taking place in Western Europe. And we need uh, a whole world to catch up and to have a global level playing field regarding respect for human rights for, for business. And the other big track are the investors. And we published yesterday um, an investor's uh, analysis of investors regarding business and human rights, uh, very significant report, a very, uh, uh, let's say, deep report, and it has incredible potential. Just one example, the UN Principles for Responsible Investment, that many of you are very aware and even part of it, have announced last October the expectation that from less than 5% of signatories that have a policy regarding business and human rights or to respect human rights linked to the investment criteria, they want to move in five years to 95% of the 4,000 signatories. That can be an unbelievably transformational. And of course, we're ready to support uh, that effort. And finally, our, our report issued yesterday signals 
one word when we think about the next decade of uh, implementation of the guiding principles, which is implementation. And we all need to work together. We have the conditions to have a shared vision and a shared ambition looking into the next decade of implementation and beyond focusing on implementation and its effectiveness. Um, and that is, let's say my final remark, implementation and effectiveness, all the world with a level playing field around respect for human rights by business. And that is the task that we have in front of us. And we believe, and I believe as chair of the working group and my colleagues from the working group, that it is possible, it is realistic to be way more ambitious because we have the right foundations. Without the right foundations, being ambitious would be wishful thinking. But having the right foundations allows all of us to work together, each one in its respective function, but, but with coordination, maximizing synergies, and being able to realistically uh, be ambitious, as I said before. So those were my, let's say, introduction, introductory remarks. Uh, you can go to the report. All of what I said is actually in written, uh, has been presented. And one thing that uh, we just witnessed a few minutes ago, no single member state of the United Nations have raised a hand to say, this is wrong, this is not working, this is not the way to go, and this is not the right framework to make it work. Uh, so we have the conditions, as I said. Um, Okay, so now I would like to move into the first uh, panel conversation and discussion. Um, the recommitment uh, to the UN guiding principles and, um, and the consultation and discussion of the roadmap. So the road ahead, what do we have ahead? And we will have three uh, panelists, John Denton, Secretary General, the International Chamber of Commerce, Sandal Jambo, CEO and Executive Director of the UN Global Compact, and Sharon Barrow, Secretary General of the International Trade Union Confederation. And we'll go immediately uh, to ask John, uh, how have the guiding principles impacted the private sector and how can we make the next 10 years a decade of action to accelerate the guiding principles implementation? John, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Dante. And actually, thanks very much for your leadership. And uh, I think uh, all these roles uh, the leadership roles within the UN to develop um, new approaches take a lot of um, endeavor, but they actually generally characterized when they're successful by people of goodwill who actually put their shoulder to the wheel and actually keep talking, keep engaging. So I compliment you on that. Um, I'm here today for a number of reasons, a number of points I want to make. The first is I do want to reaffirm the commitment of the International Chamber of Commerce to the UN uh, princ uh, principles, guiding principles, the UN GPS. Uh, let me, let me, allow me to simply call them the principles on the way through because um, I find the, uh, the plethora of acronyms in this game are so confusing to people who are actually just tune in for a little while. So these principles are very important. And I do recognize, since we were there at the beginning, though I was not, uh, one of the things that really drove the ICC's engagement was that this had the capacity, if implemented effectively, to be transformational. I think that's still the point that we hang on to, Dante. Um, but we hang on to it because we actually believe it's achievable, um, but we have to be frank um, to actually in, engage in constructive conversations. Uh, the first thing I say is actually very much reflective of what you've said, Dante, as well as that we acknowledge the transformational nature of the principles, but a lot more needs to be done. Uh, there's, this is not about a leisurely pace. This is about ensuring a collaborative approach to achieving an outcome, which is quite different to what was there before this commenced. So let's never forget that this is actually changing, not just attitudes, but also behaviors, and then ensuring that that's locked in. And that's the important bit, getting those things in place. It's gonna be done, it's very important, but we also should be honest. Um, what's pleasing is that we're actually starting to talk now about the smart mix, not one or the other, not purely voluntary, not purely mandatory, what the principles in order to implement them always envisaged was getting that to a smart mix. But you won't get to a smart mix unless there's a truly collaborative approach where you respect the different views. And the reason we talk about this, frankly, is there are genuinely different views, particularly among larger business with a lot of resources available to them and smaller businesses. Smaller businesses, which actually make up the vast bulk of the global economy, 
if you ask them and see this as a regulatory burden, what they actually want to see this is, and this is where we want to get them to, is to see the principles for what they are transformational. So helping them get there as at the same time as ensuring that we live by the principles requires collaboration, requires uh, engagement, and requires ultimately coming up with this uh, uh, smart mix, as, as, as you describe it and as we describe it as well, which is actually a balance both of regulatory and voluntary, but getting that mix right so that it actually is effective is the key thing. But in the end, the key thing is, this is the other point I want to make, is impact on the ground. The danger with a lot of these processes is they end up being talked about as processes, which is fine. I understand the importance of process, but process is only useful if it gets you to an outcome. The outcome we want to see is action on the ground, and action on the ground, which actually is delayed and should not be delayed, particularly for the most vulnerable. So we do see as the private sector the need not just to settle this issue in terms of uh, getting the collaboration right, and that's respect for each other's views and putting each other's interests at the same level, level as one's own, but actually ensuring that there's actually outcomes here. So rhetoric won't get us there, outcomes ultimately will. And in that context, it's why it's, ple it's pleasing to be uh, in this collaborative mode, as, we, as I genuinely am with, with Sharon and certainly with Sander. Uh, and that's why it's great to bring together the three, civil society, private sector, and the union movement, because there is a genuine commitment to the principles. We need to work together in a collaborative way to get the right mix of smart outcome, smart mix, which can actually be implemented on the ground. But the last thing I'll say to you is that the ICC is committed. We, um, we delivered a declaration for how we will seek to influence the global uh, economy in the 21st century in the same way as which we influence the global economy in the 20th century. Key to that is actually ensuring that we fight against the, rise of the global, global rise of inequality, but importantly, that we ensure fairness, and then importantly, that we ensure that the respect that is actually underpins the principles are reflected in the way in which the global economy operates. So we are not, not only committed as a matter of goodwill, we are committed as a matter of strategy and purpose. And so you'll find the ICC as a willing partner uh, as we move forward to the next decade. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like just to ask you a follow-up question because we agree on the need of having that data, uh, um, the information, um, and also the need to work on the SME sphere and including the, the informal economy world, which counts for 60% of the workers. So it's a, it's a huge task that we have in front of us. But one, one question, uh, for, follow up question for you is how you imagine going to the local level because we have good traction, let's say in the Western European and some uh, Northern countries, but the traction in many other places and sometimes the, the lack of traction is just because there's a wrong perception. Sometimes is a perception that this is a sort of a leftist agenda that is nothing to be to go around with business with some, uh, let's say UN abstract agenda that is not connected to reality. So how can we make this narrative a reality in everywhere uh, and I'm just thinking in the role of industry associations from the mainstream to, to be the voice that actually mobilizes the mainstream of business around the world into this same uh, agenda. What unites the ICC, and as you know, we bring together more than 45 million companies, which is enabling business worldwide to secure peace, prosperity, and opportunity for all. For all. Opportunity for all all prosperity for all that's the whole kind of beast of the icc yes and there's different stages and there's different levels of emphasis and different speed levels that operate throughout the economy but one of through the global economy what's really important dante i think is to keep up to speed this morning i was on a call with a very significant group of african businesses they see now ICC as being there to help them create sustainable business models to ensure the sustainable recovery. So we're talking together about how we will deploy, deploy $5 billion to actually, emerge, actually help create 5 million new SMEs, which will employ up to 25 million people. Those SMEs want to be developed on the basis of ICC principles, which are aligned to the sustainable development goals, aligned to the global principles about here as well. So the um, between North and South or between uh, uh, UN and non-UN, big and small, there is actually a common purpose here. To, in order to ensure that common purpose is delivered, we do need to get a collaborative model. That's the really important thing, but it has to be informed by principles. And to actually get a good outcome, we never believe in being reduced 
to a, the lowest common denominator. We believe in actually coming to a compromise and to a collaborative outcome based on principles. And these principles are critical for us. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much. Uh, that, was, that was really good. And, and we are in agreement in that uh, rationale of uh, looking after uh, a compromise um, and the possibility to actually collaborate and work together. We are doing that actually on a regular basis with ICC and you have been very active in this process of evaluating the 10 first years of the guiding principle. So thanks, thanks again. Um, Sandra, um, I will go to you as the CEO of Global Compact, uh, Sandra Diambo. Uh, how can the UN Global Compact help business at the local level implement the guiding principles and how uh, that support of implementation can in fact uh, help achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, you are on the ground and you are the hub for innovation and, uh, and pioneering. So um, yeah, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Dante. Uh, really good to be here and also with, with Shan and John, greetings to you all. Look, I think, you know, we, we, we spoke about, you, you said it in your comments, you know, glass half full, half empty, I think. John also spoke to the need for, for ambition and action. And I think that that's really the part where, you know, uh, the Global Compact really wants to put its focus and its effort. You know, since the principles were endorsed 10 years ago, I think for us and our membership, the task at hand has become ever so clear. And, you know, we continue to, to reaffirm our commitment to these principles. Um, you know, um, with the adoption of the 2030 goals, I think that also furthered the importance of the guiding principles in the work that we do. We often say and have looked at all the goals and actually, you know, most, or I think it's 90% of the, of the goal of the 196 targets that you see in the SDGs also have a link back to international human rights treaties and labor standards. So the two really firmly do go hand in hand. And, you know, I think it's, it's really fair to say that the human rights agenda fits very firmly into the sustainable business agenda. And what we've seen with our business membership over time, actually, is that the business community is becoming increasingly more aware and more aware of the fact that there's so much urgency in really addressing human rights issues and prioritizing it. I think we saw this through COVID more than anything else over the last um, year or so. We have about 70 uh, networks uh, around the world at, at present and the guiding principles are core to how all of them are navigating the impact on, on people and planet. What we've done within the local networks uh, and, and many of them actually have human rights working groups and these groups comprise of both SMEs and local companies and multinationals and we formed a couple of working groups where companies share amongst peers, share experiences, share lessons learned and we consistently see over time that human rights is one of the most um, areas of, one of the highest areas of topical interest amongst our business membership. So just another clear sign that the global business community is continuing to develop its understanding of the corporate responsibility around human rights. I think what we see and what the biggest challenge for us continues to be the gap between business aspiration and business commitments and real business action that is tangible and is measurable on the ground. And I think that's where we need to continue to focus our efforts. Um, oftentimes business leaders just ask for, for the how. They, they're comfortable in making the commitment. They, they know what the ambition is, but they just need to know a little bit more about the how. Uh, a few weeks ago, we launched a, a, an e-learning course actually on business and human rights to help you know, advance some of that knowledge and give people the right, the right toolkit uh, to support their mindset around the changes that they wanted to do. And we developed this in collaboration with the, the UN High Commission of Human Rights um, as well. So, you know, I think for us, as I said, the, the, the key issue is bridging that gap between the ambition, the commitment and, and real action, accelerating towards urgency, because I think it's important. But what I do see that is of, you know, of, you know in support of your piece around the glass being half full is the continued interest um, around and among businesses in addressing human rights in a way that makes sense, just not for rights on their own, but rights and sustainable business and, and rights and the sustainable development goals. Thank you, uh, Sandra. In, in fact, you, you answered my already my follow-up question, uh, which, which was about the ambition on the ground. Um, so I would like to really thank you very much for your intervention. We will continue to engage with Global Compact New York and Global Compact uh, local networks, which has been the case systematically since our working group was set up. So, uh, so we will continue this engagement and thank you again for contributing so actively into this process. Thanks.
and 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 I will go now to uh, Sharon Barrow. Um, we were in an, an event just a few minutes ago discussing pretty much the same challenges, but you were uh, observing and making remarks on, let's say, what governments are saying. But anyway, so uh, what do we all need to do over the next 10 years to take implementation of the guiding principles to the next level and to make a real impact on the ground? The floor is yours, Sharon. Thank you, Dante, and thank you, John and Sander. I must say, you started with the word coherence, and that's exactly what our major challenge is now. And John and I both are on the board of the Global Compact, so together with Sander and the other board members, this is in fact the home of where they bring our history on human and labour rights, and indeed environmental standards together, because the principles actually were born of the ILO and its fundamental rights, now just over 100 years old, because leaders, government leaders, came together with Labor <clears throat> and we actually invited business as well, now a key member of the tripartite family. But it was accepted that if we were going to survive, and of course this was reinforced in 1944 with the Philadelphia Declaration after another world war and the Great Depression, that if we were going to survive, if business was going to survive, if democracy was going to prosper, you needed a stable social floor. And of course, the UN Declaration on Human Rights is in its eighth decade. And so in that context, when you look at the global compact principles, they're brought together, the fundamental rights, the key uh, human rights principles. And at the heart of that is freedom is democratic rights and freedom, freedom of association for business, for unions, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, all of those things that hang off those UN principles. And of course, we have to, uh, you know, Sandra knows I, I believe this and, and others do too, but we need to now lift the environmental principles because you can't deal with human rights or labour rights if you don't actually deal with, uh, with environmental stance. And to some extent, indeed uh, um, corruption, which of course is the scourge of, uh, of free uh, freedom in terms of people and business. So what I would say is I'm a bit uncompromising. I totally agree with John that uh, indeed we have to move, you know, we have to include small business and we have to look at how to create an enabling business environment. But most of the small businesses are picked up in responsibility in major supply chains or domestic supply chains from, from the larger and multinationals. Some aren't, some are multinationals in themselves and they have got the resources. But we believe you have to move from voluntary to mandatory. Why? Because our democratic rights and freedoms, the heart of democracy itself is at risk. I would contend it's very difficult for business to, to facilitate their own success and indeed, uh, um, you know, fair, uh, uh, the d dignity of decent work if you don't have democratic rights and freedoms. And we'll launch our Global Rights Index tomorrow. It's an appalling story of a loss of civil liberties, of human and labour rights. And this is from countries where you've got, you know, over 70% of countries actually impeding or constraining those uh, incredibly important um, centerpieces of, of freedom. So I would say just two things. One is that if we're going to have fair competition for business, then we need to move from voluntary to mandatory. We'll always look at the issues around small business. But if you don't have companies respecting the rule of law and developing their own practice against the three pillars, not just the principles, but the three pillars of action, Due diligence, where's the risk? And indeed, the capacity then to set up grievance procedures at all levels, practical procedures that allow for due process and representation to affect remedy. And then, you know, we all need to, to work together to both identify the risk, to find the measure of remedy, and then to monitor the health of our supply chains, because 94% of the workforce is still in obscurity as a hidden workforce. And you all know that much of that is dehumanizing exploitation, including 
forced and child labor. So ending impunity, actually looking at how the Global Compact can now advise business along with John and in partnership with us to put in place the, the practical steps and to look at the peer learning that brings together companies who are already making change, incredible change. But unless we end impunity and that will require the rule of law, then we will see the, the continuing success of those businesses who simply want to take profit at any cost, create an environment for, um, for exploitation. That's not, in fact, the, uh, the businesses I choose to work with, but of course, we, instead we choose to fight them. But those businesses who do have a human and labor rights consciousness are trying to actually change their business practice, need the support of the rule of law, and indeed, where necessary, the kind of compliance that has sanctions for those who are the worst offenders. But rule of law, Dante, is not, it, 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 the sanctions aren't our first option. Working together, but having that as a backbone, but working together to change business practice, to get that fair competition floor, that's what we want to see. Perfect. Thank you, Sharon. And, uh... And uh, I appreciate very much your, your comments. And actually, I think we will be, for the most part, on the same page. Um, it makes sense uh, and it's something reasonable. Uh, and actually, it's reflected in the submission that global unions, in, led by you, made already in the process of evaluating the first 10 years. I, I just want to conclude this uh, session, this uh, panel, with what is happening next. Uh, we just concluded uh, and presented um, the, um, the stop taking exercise for the first 10 years of implementation. And we will be working towards the end of the year until 30, the 31st of October in the roadmap for the next decade of implementation. Uh, and this will be presented in the 10th Annual Forum on Business and Human Rights here in Geneva between the 29th of November and the 1st of December. So in short, we still need you on board on this uh, stage because we will be building the ambition and we want to build the ambition to be, uh, let's say, uh, ambitious and at the same time realistic with differentiated uh, roles to be played by ones and others, but under the same umbrella. And that is, I'm sure we will count on you as we have, have counted in the past uh, to build this agenda together collaboratively uh, based on participation and inclusiveness. So uh, thank you again for participating in this session and for ICC for inviting uh, me to moderate and to make the opening and closing remarks. Um, and I would like to handle the floor to Caroline Rees, president of SHIFT, uh, who will moderate uh, the second panel. And excuse myself because these days are pretty crazy in, in Geneva and I have to actually run next door to an event that already it started um, and they need my presence. So sorry and thank you again very much. Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dante, and a pleasure to pick up the conversation from yourself and uh, your panelists there, which we've been listening to closely. And I'm delighted to be joined myself by three uh, panelists, uh, indeed, from the business world. Um, let me introduce them briefly. Uh, Steve Crown is the Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for Human Rights at Microsoft, a company that barely needs introduction, a large information technology firm, of course, one of the largest companies in the world. Uh, we have with us also Ferdinando Falcone, who is the head of human rights at Enel, the energy company, which operates in over 30 states itself. And by Mary Thuo, the CEO and founder of Cityscape Trends, which is a professional cleaning services company in Kenya and itself very much um, focused on uh, social enterprise and uh, human rights issues. Delighted to be joined by the three of you. We'll plunge straight into our conversation. We've heard a lot about the looking back over 10 years. And we've heard John Denton from the International Chamber of Commerce speak to the need to move past concepts and processes to actions and outcomes. And Steve, let me come to you first. Um, as you look back over 10 years now, when you look at the actual hard edge of practice and what you see going on in business, with business, on the ground, have things changed? And if so, how much have things changed? Can't hear you, Steve. 
Well, somebody had to do that, sorry. <laughs> uh, I do think it has changed quite significantly and the UNGPs have been a critical part of that. Um, you know, there's a, there's a growing sense, I think, across the globe, and especially in the U.S., on the social responsibility of a business. That, you know, it, it, there is a, a form of social compact. You know, why are companies allowed to uh, conduct themselves with the rights they have? And it really is to improve the, the lives of citizens and people across the globe. I would say what the UNGPs have done is crystallize in a really helpful way these notions of rule of law, and then human-centered, human rights framework for thinking about responsible business practices. Um, I, I go back to within the human rights framework, you know, these notions of human dignity, uh, freedoms and liberties, but also empowerment and experiences. If you look at the rights that are granted, they're not just to protect us against certain things, but also to allow us to do certain things as human beings endowed with dignity. And I, I'd say inside Microsoft, what's happened is a cultural change that wasn't because of the UNGPs, but the UNGPs were especially helpful in driving that change. It's leadership at the top and then a way of doing business. I'll, I'll stop my comments by noting one of the ways that I uh, refer to this internally and then in most of my external engagements is a call for 21st century multi-stakeholderism, which I think is fully grounded in the UN guiding principles. And that is, if you think of the 20th century, companies used to just say, hey, there was a problem, we'll, we'll devise a solution. And then it would be announced. It would be, hey, broad audience of, of customers and people in the world, here's what we're doing. If you wanna provide feedback, please do. What we have in the 21st century, most things are happening globally. We recognize that now. And we need inclusive processes. So this is not letting a company alone, but actually in an inclusive engaged process, define the risks, help define the potential harms, explore collectively and collaboratively. And this is with governments, but it's civil society, it's the impacted end users or customers. Um, what are the mitigations that might be helpful? And then again, collectively define what would success look like? Not have industry say, this is what we're going to do and um, you know, leave it at that. But it's an ongoing dialogue and many of the previous comments were on this notion of we need to be more inclusive, we need more transparency, we need to be talking about how do people identify a harm, how do they bring that grievance, that harm forward, and then what does the remedy look like and how do we uh, do more? I think the UNGPs are exactly the right framing tool uh, that we should be uh, emphasizing as we go forward in this effort. I'll stop there, but hope to join later as, uh, in further dialogue, thanks. Absolutely, Stephen. I mean, you really bring out there the, the, the richness that sits behind that idea of what gets referred to as stakeholder engagement. It could sound like just another process. It can be done well, it can be done poorly, but what you're reflecting on is it's it's really partnering up. It's, it's a partnered conversation, it's a dialogue. And, and Mary, I, I wanna to come to you, do join us on, on video as well, because um, you're a, a smaller company, you're operating in Kenya, you have a workforce that are going out and providing cleaning services in, in, in commercial office spaces. Um, and you've just been experiencing, like we all have, COVID, right? Uh, so this, when I think about what Steve's saying here about engaging with the people who are on the sharp end of these effects of life, that must be very real for you. So uh, yeah, how does this play out in your business? Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, thank you, Steve, for those remarks that you have said. Uh, for us at Cityscape Trends, engaging, engaging, it is number one, engaging, number two, engaging, number three, engaging. Because we have seen that if we don't engage our people, we don't engage the customers, it is very hard for us to be able to, um, to, to solve the real impacts, the, uh, the negative impacts, the positive in impacts, making them better, it is impossible. So the first step with the deal, uh, the, with the, the ongoing process on the United Nations uh, guiding principles, uh, step one, the first thing we do is first of all, engage people so that we can be able to identify the impact. So that then if we can be able to do the first step of engaging people, identifying our negative and positive impact, then we can actually go to the second step of the due diligence process, which is um, then integrating these impacts into our policies, 
we can integrate them into our best practices we can integrate them into various departments may it be procurement may it be finance um uh, caroline i'll give you an example what we did for us to be uh, when it comes to uh, engaging people we have the um we have uh, two um, uh, two programs that we started the one of the first programs that we did was uh on uh, health and uh, well-being of workers at workplace where we came up with a program called cycling to work um in this program we had to start engaging them so that we know uh, do they really do they really need the bicycles um and then we also had to understand that the cost of transport had really escalated how then do we come because these people walk long distance to go to work how then do we come in and uh, and uh, he listened to them and then um, uh, integrate these impacts. And uh, we were thinking that we should give them the bicycles to ride, uh, for, for them to be riding to work, but the bicycles should belong to the company. But they said, no, look, we would like uh, to own the, the bicycles. And we thought it was really good if we did not engage them on this then it would be uh it could be like um we are pushing things on their throats down their throats but when we engage people we get to to be able to solve problems properly we engage we are able to prevent we are able to address and we are able to come up with solutions uh, for the way uh, for the next way forward back to you caroline you are mute Sorry, thank you. I've done it myself. Um, so Mary, hearing there from you how this, this really um, brings home the lived experience of people that you can't understand without that engagement. And Ferdinando, in coming to you, I'm, I'm fascinated to hear, you know, from your perspective in a larger company, um, both how you think about this engagement piece, but then also you've got a much larger organization in which that has to filter through to mean something in in action, right? Uh, it's 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 not it's not as short a, a distance to travel for the messages. So love to hear a bit from you about that voice and how you bring in and understand the perspectives of people who may be affected by the company, but then how you play that on into business decisions because ultimately that that's what's what, where it's needed. Well, I would like to first say that uh, UNGP is also for our company has been like an atomic bomb <laughs> for the way in which we engage with people and we look at human rights. They basically put human rights into our agenda. Uh, a company like ours in our sector uh, has experienced in the past a lot of mistakes and a lot of opposition as well. With UNGPs, we have this common framework uh, uh, that help us to operate uh, all over the world and uh, uh, we have a, a lot of panelists before have talked about policy coherence UNGPs has helped us to have uh, an high level framework uh, to be compliant with uh, then uh, the, um, um, going directly to to the action i mean uh, it helped us to design a due diligence process and creating a shared value model uh, that wherever we go in whatever stage of our business processes help us to uh, stay on the same table with the local communities with institution with uh, whatever kind of stakeholder might be interested to to our processes in order to listen to them to design a project together to understand their needs uh, and have a precise strategy this does not mean that uh, once you have listened to them you have to stop you need to engage with them continuously because uh, issues may change and uh, also the needs of people uh, might change as well the, and uh, we try to do this uh, <laughs> wherever we operate you can understand that uh, this is not an easy job um, as i said before issues may change so uh, so rapidly and especially after the pandemic period is even worse so it, really getting that sense of this being an ongoing dialogue it's not a transactional thing let's have a conversation with one it's an ongoing uh, engagement as as realities evolve and Ferdinando, let me just stay with you for a moment because you know you're a company that looks at works with energy and renewables right and and that is sort of the the, the green side of where we need to go environmentally but I'd be interested in talking to all of you a little bit about holistic approaches, right? And, and so your business particularly brings to mind for me that intersection between the environmental and the social. Sharon referred to it in her remarks. And how do you see these areas coming together as you think about how you as a company contribute holistically to sustainable development? Well, looking at the environmental side and the human rights side uh, is fundamental. Um, 
they, they go hand in hand, <laughs> especially working on the, on the renewable project. Uh, we need to take care not only on the, uh, um, of the new project, but also of the phasing out of, of the old ones. Uh, moving through the just transition means that uh, you are uh, switching um, um, the benefit from one country to another and uh, you, you need to take care also to the dark side of this, uh, of this uh, huge, uh, huge change. Uh, we need to, um, uh, to pay attention uh, on the disengagement part when, uh, when you face out uh, because uh, it's true. Uh, that uh, you are somehow um, helping uh, the, the environmental side because you are lowering the emission, but you, uh, you must pay attention that you are also impacting uh, the right shoulder of that place where you used to operate. Right, so getting those real just transition angles to, to that there as well. And Steve, you know, very different sector in many ways, but, but I'm guessing that there's a lot of resonance in thinking about the, the intersection of these subject areas as well from, from your vantage point. You need to unmute, Steve. Steve, we can't hear you. <laughs> it's the repeat curse of Zoom yeah, there. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good at muting myself. Um, <laughs> in our case, um, our commitment to sustainability and the environment is less grounded in human rights than in our awareness of what it just means for the globe and uh, you know the, the future of the planet. Uh, so we have been carbon neutral uh, since middle of last decade. We're actually um, aspiring and we've made public announcements about becoming carbon negative, meaning that by 2050, we expect to have removed more carbon from the atmosphere than we produced in our entire supply chain and all of our data center operations, all of the rest, all of the use of PCs in the entire history of the company. So we are committed to it in, at a multi-billion dollar stake at that level, very public commitments. The technologies don't even exist yet. What we've announced and what we're actively engaged in is investing in startups and, and um, promising technologies that can help us achieve that sort of thing. But um, for us, sustainability goes also to recycling. So when you think of the supply chain, not just extracting more and more and more, but how do we actually start making measurable project progress on building, uh, designing, building, um, and recovering, uh, you know, whether it's an Xbox. We aren't primarily in the hardware business, but we are, we do have lots of data centers with machines and we do produce, you know, keyboards, mice, uh, surfaces, other, other sorts of computing devices. So we think that it is intimately linked. It is part of that thing of human health and the experience we wanna to leave to the future generations. We absolutely are committed to uh, that, that dimension of sustainability. And, and uh, you, you mentioned Xbox there, and it reminded me of, of something you were telling me the other day, a different aspect of thinking holistically, right, about a company and its, its, its impacts, which, is, which was really when in a process do you engage, right? You talked about multi-stakeholderism, when in a process you engage. And you had an interesting um, reflection there with regard to Xbox and, and, and when in the sort of design process, you know, that those external voices come in. Yeah, I... Um, as I recall our conversation, one of the things I was talking about was um, my experience. I used to be the general counsel of the Xbox uh, business. And in there, we would always plan to do more for accessibility, people with disabilities to make the Xbox more accessible to that community. It's more than a billion people across the globe. But every year or every design phase, even though it would be on the design sheet, it would not actually make it into the finished product. And what uh, I was trying to flag is, as you change your perspective as to what you're really trying to achieve, not purely growing uh, profitability or market share, but growing your engagement with a community for longer term relationships. Now we have, as you might know, a very extensive, um, you know, separate peripheral marketing um, of new devices that are actually intended for those who cannot use the classic joypad or or handheld device that would have been part of the Xbox thing. And this, a similar process has happened in human rights and in uh, sustainability. It's actually having at the highest level of the corporation leadership saying, we care about this. This is the way we're going to conduct our business. And then getting that all the way into design and into the gating process. In an engineering company, 
things are, you know, first there's an idea, then it becomes a bit of a, um, a, a, a back of envelope design, then it goes through a design phase. But having checkpoints and gates and tools to make sure people are actually looking at these various dimensions, including accessibility. It started way back with security and privacy, but we were able to build on that learning and now we apply it all the way into human rights reviews. So there's a, a very great organization that we have for um, artificial intelligence and machine learning with um, participants, including senior executives at all stages of developing these and launching and then overseeing the use of these products. Right, so really planning it in from the earlier stages and it changes your outlook right. on and Yeah, th these things cannot be bolt-ons. They have to be built in and engineered or they, they simply won't work right. Yeah, um, Mary, let, let me come to you and uh, take a, perhaps a different dimension of this sort of holistic thinking, right? Because um, we're often talking indeed with large companies that are talking about their suppliers, their service providers. You're a service provider and you're talking about your clients, the buyers of your services, right? And from your perspective, trying to uh, ensure uh, the right treatment of your workforce and, and living wages for your workforce, it matters what your buyers do. So tell us a little bit about that as well. Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, we are very concerned uh, about um, people who engage with us, people we, who we engage with, because for us, I think what we come to understand is uh, for us to be able to engage with people on a human right level, uh, where people are doing the right thing, we need people with the same values as us. So uh, well, we have come to see that uh, uh, as we do business, it is very difficult. It's very difficult to to, to buy uh, people to buy from us if our values are not the the right values or us buying from people who ha do not have the uh, right values. And uh, when we talk about the va right values, is uh, principles that we stand for. What is it that you stand for? What is it that you believe that it is the right thing? Even doing uh, doing the right thing is difficult. Even while doing the right thing is difficult. For example, Caroline, we stand for the the four principles um, as, at Cityscape, no corruption, we do not condone corruption. So we have to wear our code of ethics on our sleeves where everybody can see we do not do these things. And um, we, we also have, we don't have to wear them on the head, uh, in our heads where nobody can see actually what we stand for. So we tell people we do not uh, engage in corruption. And we find that um, we customers buy for us because from us, they say that we want to engage with these people. They have good values. We tell people we are standing for human rights. That's what we, we believe and stand for and believe it's the right thing to do. So uh, we treat our workers properly. We ensure there's no pollution in the environment. And Caroline, this has been very interesting because uh, uh, unless you have people with the same values, it is very hard for you to move to the next level. For example, we had the cycling to work. We approached nine companies. Most of them uh, were like Mary, no, for us it's about money. Money is number one. Of course, money is for everybody, but if you put money number one on the list, then uh, it doesn't work like that. It's uh, do the right thing first and then um, let money be the byproduct of uh, doing the right thing. So these nine companies said, no, I actually gave up. You know, I reached a point that I gave up uh, engaging, you know, looking for people with the same value. And then one of my sustainability manager was able to meet a company that has values like us and they were able to now engage with us in terms of collaboration. Back to you, Caroline. Wonderful, Mary. And, and Ferdinand, let me come finally to, to yourself again, because that piece that Mary talks about there around values, right? Uh, it, it speaks to culture. It's, it speaks to governance. It comes from, gosh, it comes from the top of the organization. It comes from the heart of the organization. And, and in your experience at, at, at NL, what has been most significant um, around getting the, the, the move to the right governance to make the organization live respect for human rights? 
Well, actually, it was really the first effect of the UNGPs on, uh, on, on our company because somehow we uh, had a specific commitment to our uh, human rights policy. And of course, the board has the specific commitment of, of oversight, the implementation of the policy through our due diligence system. And we have now a specific committee that oversight all the processes. And of course, uh, having uh, such a presence and such an oversight of these uh, actions means that we are able to strengthen our action also because you know since the top move everyone will uh, will follow and uh, uh, it's also important for making uh, the, the the people working on the subject on this subject accountable for what they are actually doing and understanding if they are moving on the wrong direction to uh, to change it uh, in a while and correct the action and make the right things Fernando, thank you so much. Um, uh, yes, Steve, I see you coming in. Yeah, Please. I was just going to make a comment on the, the notion of principles. Um, I thought that was really uh, important what Mary noted. <clears throat> We've actually been quite clear. If you have a principle, but you'll compromise it because there's more money to be had by compromising it, it's not much of a principle. So mm -hmm. this notion of being clear in a company about the principles and using the GNP, UNGPs to help define some of the principles you're going to apply to particular scenarios um, is a huge part of, of the value that the UNGPs have brought. And it, it is ultimately, in our view, a way of expanding our opportunity. As people trust the way we operate, they'll be more trusting of the services we provide. And so there's got to be a virtuous cycle. And, and again, it's this multi-stakeholderism of having that dialogue and demonstrating it's, it's easy to talk the talk. It's, it's how do you actually live it and practice it. So uh, again, I think the UNGPs have been Fantastic at helping people articulate principles that are grounded in human rights. Thanks. Fantastic. Ferdinando, did I see you coming in too? Yes. I just want to say something about the multi-stakeholder approach because in my opinion is the only way we have for tackling the human rights issue in the next decade. But this, not, this does not mean that we need to stay all together and discuss about topic, but find the solution for company like our be challenged by civil society organization institution and understanding the right way for achieving the goal that are out there in the SDGs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Tying it back to those those meta goals that we have. Um, Panelists, thank you so very much. We've had one wonderful points at the end there around leadership and values and to the point that it's easy to say things, it's a lot harder to make an organization live and breathe this, this stuff. It, it takes time, but your points about engaging in a really deep listening way with the folks who are on the sharp end, who, who, who suffer the effects of, of, of business activities when not done right and integrating that insight into business decisions, starting early, uh, starting at the development process um, of a product, of a, of a service, um, looking at every link in that value chain, right? Whether you're a buyer vis-a-vis -a, -vis a supplier, a supplier vis-a-vis -a, -vis a uh, a buyer as well. Um, and, and I think this may be the only uh, first and last time that I'll hear an atomic explosion used as a positive analogy. So I, I, I thank you for, for that, Ferdinando. And uh, with that huge thanks, Steve, Ferdinando, Mary, very much for joining me for this panel. And I'll hand it back to our organizers. Thank you. Caroline, thank you very much indeed. And thanks to all, our, all of our panelists today. I've got two minutes to sum up. My name is Andrew Wilson. I'm the Director of Policy at ICC. Uh, and I think all I can really do in the time is, is a huge word of thanks to our co-organizers today, the UN Global Compact, for their partnership on this event, which we uh, value tremendously. Huge thanks also to our uh, many uh, speakers for making their time available today. And of course, our two moderators, Dante and Caroline. Um, I think we've, we've heard very clearly some positive things on today's call. There's clearly been a decade of progress since the launch of the uh, UN Guiding Principles. Clearly many challenges remain. We're very conscious of that as ICC. And really to coin a phrase that's often used in the context of the SDGs, we want the second decade of the right guiding principles to be a decade of action. And we're fully committed to doing all we can as the International Chamber of Commerce to support effective policy reforms where policy reforms are needed but also to support businesses in the journey and to fully integrating uh, respect for human rights into their operations 
through their entire value chains. And on that note, I'd just like to say to any business representatives in the audience, we do have a special group on business and human rights run by my two colleagues, Crispin Conroy and Sierra Leda, who you've seen earlier. And please do join that group if, if you are interested in finding out more about how you can address some of the challenges that have been articulated on today's call, but also how we can work together effectively to forge uh, vital public-private partnerships and also drive policy reforms where policy reforms are needed at the country level or indeed at the global level. So please do reach out to us if that work is of interest. This agenda is an absolute priority for us and let's hope together we can make the next decade to come for the UN Guiding Principles a real genuine decade of action. Huge thanks again and for those of you in Europe, enjoy your evening. For those of you in the US, have a good afternoon. Many, many thanks indeed. Bye-bye.